Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Early Music Podcast this season. Today, we are going to be talking about bringing early music sources back to life in performance and the process early music artists go through to better understand the lost elements of musical performance. That is to say, the parts of a musical work which were not notated in the score or would have been taken for granted by the composer. You might call this component improvisation. It certainly is the case that the further back we go through time, the more improvisation was a key component to many genres of European music. In this episode, we'll be looking at the toccatas of the early 17th century keyboardist and composer Girolamo Frescobaldi, who practically invented the genre of virtuosic keyboard compositions. His toccatas, though written down, were a hybrid of an improvisatory invention as well as a thought-out composition. And while they came with strict instructions by the composer as to how they should have been performed, certain elements of those compositions were left to the performer to be decorated. Today, we will look at just one small example to illustrate the process that early music performers go through to help inform their work. So, are you ready for this? Join me our combined strength bring order to the galaxy oh man mm-hmm. and here we go this is the early music podcast with your host andrew bird brought to you by rayma the early music network Episode 2 Whenever you approach a score, you approach it with your own priorities and you're free of establishing them. That's Francesco Corti, international artist and conductor, professor of harpsichord at the Schola Cantorum Basiliensis in Basel, Switzerland. We cannot try to do something which is completely impossible. Mm -hmm. Reconstruct something from the past is impossible for so many reasons. First of all, because we are very different from any public from the past. And of course, a performance is a two-way communication system. So you can't try to reconstruct one entity while the other is completely unreconstructable. What we can try to do is to look at the music that we have which is basically the printed music, that's what we normally have from the past, and consciously decide on priorities. And on some priorities we can try a tent, I wouldn't call it a, a reconstruction to cool, but a creative reconstruction. As I mentioned in the introduction to this episode, we are going to be talking about the music of Girolamo Frescobaldi. Frescobaldi was born in Ferrara in 1583 and was organist at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome from 1608 until his death in 1643 and was among a generation of composers who spearheaded a change in musical tastes which kickstarted the musical era we know today as the Baroque. This generation, which undertook a project to break away from the strict polyphonic rules-based system of the 16th century, which was exemplified by composers such as Giovanni Perluigi da Palestrina and Josquin des Prés, and replace it with a system where more harmonic and contrapuntal freedom was allowed in order to better serve the dramatic needs of a given work while serving to present a clear and comprehensible delivery of a given text to an audience. With this break, and the establishment of what became known by contemporaries as the Seconda Practica, came a freedom for instrumentalists like Girolamo Frescobaldi to display their virtuosity and invention in performances unbound by the rules of the Prima Practica. Frescobaldi was at once the most flamboyantly impressive keyboard composer of his time and the most characteristic, because it was characteristic of early 17th century music to be flamboyantly impressive. Frescobaldi's toccatas from his Libri d'Intavolatura were his most inventive, most theatrical, and most unpredictable compositions, but given this description, it's still very difficult when approaching this music for the first time to understand how it should be performed. So, Francesco, how would you go about this? Find an instrument that resembles something that Frescobaldi might have had, 
understand this notation, understand the music of his uh, contemporaries as much as I can, and also know as much music as I can from his context, have a look at the art, have a look at the patronage uh, system of his time, the priorities of, of what a sponsor would want to hear, for example. I'm not trying to bring Frescobaldi back to life. Sure. That's definitely impossible. Despite the music being published about 400 years ago, Frescobaldi's toccatas in his first uh, Libro d'Intavolatura are, to the modern eye, very clearly written in a musical uh, score or notation which we could understand today. However, there is still a lot of information which is generally missing from the musical pages or the pages with the musical notation on them about how we should actually perform these pieces. What information does Frescobaldi leave behind for us to help us perform this music once again? So first of all, we must say we are very lucky um, that uh, Girolamo Frescobaldi belonged uh, to a generation that was very self-conscious in, in the sense they knew um, they were part of a musical revolution. So those are the years of the Seconda Pratica of Monteverdi, of the birth of opera in Florence. If you want to learn more about this period and these composers, you'll also want to listen to the next episode, episode three of this series. A lot of other uh, small revolutions. It's really a, a deep change in musical taste, in musical writing, and musical principles. Not only that, but it's also it's a, uh, um, a generation that worked for a patronage that was looking for novelty and highly personal works. They knew what they were doing was something very new. And they also knew that when they published music, so this is really the case of, of Frescobaldi, they needed to explain how to read it, how to play, how to perform it in a way that was close to the composer's intention. So uh, we must be um, very grateful for that. So we see immediately Frescobaldi when he publishes his first book of Toccatas, he makes sure to start the book with a very long and very detailed preface on how to perform this music, how to approach the written text that we have. And this, of course, for us is an extremely precious group of information from the composer himself. In his preface explaining how to play his music, Frescobaldi is, as you say, speaking to a contemporary audience, an audience who is fluent in a style which he was diverging from in a new way. Exactly. Right. right. So he knows that he's employing um, writing means that come from the past. He's also He also is very much aware that he's um, absorbing and transforming uh, tradition, musical traditions from the past. When we think about his toccatas, the Venetians and the Napolitan influences are very clear. Of course, he gives for granted that you know that music already, but he makes sure to make a, a very strong point in pointing out what is new and why it is so new. We, of course, aren't contemporary to Frescobaldi. The link to this musical culture has been broken by time and space. But how much of the missing elements needed to unlock this music can be recovered, or, I hesitate to say it, reconstructed? I cannot give you a percentage like this. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but, I mean, with music of from so far away in the past, I would say it's 50-50, something mm. like this. Mm. So 50% is the actual notation that he left, which is very clear and quite an important note. Contemporary commentators on his playing really point out that his writing is clear, so that a lot of his intentions are already in the score. It is an interesting note that Francesco just points out there, but the problem is still the same as we're discussing. Of course, contemporary commentators can say that his instructions were very clear, but then again, they're coming from that musical culture which Frescobaldi shares and which we do not. Our job is, as you said, to recreate the context. What musical, and not only musical, what artistic visual uh, sound world these people could give for granted. This is, I mean, this is a, a kind of complicated and long process, but it's very important because otherwise we cannot really judge how Frisco Baldi's music was seen and, uh, and heard as new and, and as, a, as a breaking point, let's say, in music. Can you give us an example to better understand the musical context of Fresco Baldi's toccatas and how they might have been related to another genre in existence at the time? Well, he points out that his, that his toccatas are uh, a parallel 
to the mo- what he calls the modern madrigal of his time, which is the Seconda Pratica madrigal. We know from descriptions of those madrigals that tempo, the battuta, would be suspended or, or, or modified depending on the text. Okay, I realize that I asked the question here, but it is important to note that when we're talking about how this, the Toccatas of Frescobaldi, relate to the madrigals of exactly the same time, we still have the same problem, which is that it may be interesting from an intellectual standpoint to understand some context here, but we are just as much separated from the performance culture of the early 17th century madrigal as we are from Frescobaldi's Toccatas. So Frescobaldi is one of the first composers that makes sure to link his um, um, instrumental works to parallel or similar vocal pieces. And so we can gather information from those vocal pieces and try to find similar spots or, let's say, similar um, uh, waves of tension and release or or, uh, tempo modifications or things like that in instrumental pieces. Again, so Frescobaldi's generation was very conscious of doing a kind of transposition, a stylistic transposition, or translation even, uh, to take a vocal genre, like a, a madrigal or a solo song, with its forms of liberty and freedom, and translating it into a genre without text. So they constantly refer to the freedom of, uh, that, a, uh, that a singer would take in order to tell us, well, you should imitate that kind of freedom and that kind of structure. So we have a first hint of music we should l- look into to have a kind of, uh, to create ourselves for ourselves a kind of uh, sound uh, context. So let's look at a specific example in the Libro Primo d'Intablatura now, where Frescobaldi explains to his audience how to play a certain aspect of his music and how using information we can gather from other sources help us get closer to understanding actually what might have been performed at the time. So he says the beginnings of toccatas should be adagio, so slow, and arpeggiando. If you read this from a a modern point of view, arpeggiando means, so you have something written like this, and you play it like this. If you don't stop to this first assumption, but you dig a little bit deeper, you find out a lot of examples that you can imitate. Now, Frescobaldi almost never writes down an arpeggio, a beginning of a toccata. He normally writes down a chord. That is to say, three notes of the same rhythmic value stacked vertically on top of each other. If you'd like to see images of the music which is demonstrated in this episode, you can click on the link to the episode's webpage in the description to this podcast and find that in the bonus material. And so does his uh, very faithful pupil, uh, Froberger. So when you take Froberger's Toccata Prima, so first Toccata from his Secondo Libro, what you have on the score, and I'm going to play as, as brutally as I can, this is what's written. We do have a very beautiful prelude, what's called the, the, the Prelude non mesuré, by Louis Couperin. And nicely enough, it is entitled Prelude à l'imitation de Monsieur Froberger. Prelude at the imitation of Mr. Froberger. The two knew each other quite well, so I, we can assume the imitation is quite faithful. And this is what uh, Couperin writes. <laughs> So you see, it is an arpeggio because it's a broken chord, but it's very complex. It's much more complex than what is written. Um, and this it, is written out that way. This is entirely written out. Right. So I'm only really playing what, what Couperin wrote. We have a bunch of, of uh, examples like this. I'm going to give you a couple more just to give you an idea. So this is th- those are the, the first two bars of uh, Giovanni Picchi Toccata, curiously coming from an English source, the Fitzwilliam uh, Virginal book. Etc. Again, a very uh, it is a quite simple uh, gesture, but it is an arpeggio. But it, it, it's not the simplest arpeggio you could do in a chord. Mm-hmm. 
and it surpasses the 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 compass of the let's say of the starting chord of the piece which right. is really interesting one question the louis couperin example that we heard just before how relevant would that example be for those of us trying to understand the performance of frescobaldi's music given that louis couperin was coming from a really distant musical culture couperin was writing in a in a country where the style of froberger was not known so he wanted to make sure that people would understand he's imitating Vorberger and his gesture. In the same way that Vorberger will make sure his toccata are slightly more clear in the structure than Frescobaldi's because it, because when you export a product to an unknown public, you tend to make it a little bit more clear. So, of course, one has to be very careful. This is indirect information, but this is basically what we have. Do you have one more example for us to better inform how we should approach the beginnings of Frescobaldi's toccatas? For example, we can also look at other instruments. There are some beginnings of Kapsberger that we can use. I'm going to kill this music and play it on the harpsichord, but it's just to give you an idea. Just three short beginnings. It's really by chance that the three are in G. I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> so what you've established here is that if one were to perform a toccata of Frescobaldi today and see that the piece begins with a simple chord, again, three notes of the same rhythmic value stacked vertically on top of each other, maybe under a fermata, that the performer could choose to extemporize an improvisation in a manner similar to the examples that you've just performed for us that were written out by contemporaries. Exactly. Right. What we try to establish is a, is a sort of probability. Mm -hmm. Is it more probable that a, that a performer would just play a, a chord or something else? And this something else, what form could it be? What are the principles? Mm -hmm. um, anything that is described in improvisation from the past needs a strong context right and we have enough uh, examples from frisco baldi's time or from just before or from just after they point out to certain let's say principles for example how complex how long how composed should this be right and we can actually observe a very interesting evolution in this kind of freedom when the toccata form goes north for example goes towards germany north germany mm -hmm. this improvisation becomes more and more complex and it needs to be written out right but the function is still the same so it is it is a very interesting journey that we can try to reconstruct backwards i have a tough question for you now as we wrap things up let's come up with an hypothetical scenario where i a young harpsichord performer and enthusiast spend my entire youth growing up listening to CDs of modern performances of Frescobaldi, that is to say, performed by early music specialists. I never read a word written by the ancients on how to perform this music. I don't care about priorities. I express myself through this music how I like, but the context in which I have formed my taste comes from these modern early music recordings. When I perform this music, is it considered early music performance? It is technically. You're, you're playing music from the past, so it is technically early music. But I mean I, within the movement <laughs> of early music. Um, well, the movement of early music, the, the core of it is about creativity. And creativity, in my point of view, my very humble point of view, I, I need to stress <laughs> that, uh, really comes out of information. The more you inform yourself, the more you realize how free you are as a performer because you very simply know more about the context where this music was written and then you see how much they speak about freedom how much they sp they really speak about personal 
musical freedom. It's a very, it's a very beautiful thing to read about. Taking the example of Riscobaldi is really interesting because he's desperate to make sure that you read his instructions. He knows his contemporary wouldn't sort out his music. He wouldn't really understand just from the notes. So you can imagine how far we are from that, from that kind of context. So it's very, I guess it's very important to read. If you don't read this kind of information, you, you probably just imitate somebody else's understanding of it. And this is always very weird. So by covering in depth this tiny fragment of this one genre of compositions from a single composer, that being the introductory statements of the Toccatas of Girolamo Frescobaldi, you can begin to imagine what the artistic process for early music performers entails on a broader scale. Every repertoire for which the cultural connection has been broken by time requires numerous decisions by the artists to be made in preparation for and during a performance. Of course, not all of the information that we might like to have from those directly involved in that repertoire to help better contextualize it might be available to us today, but sometimes by looking elsewhere we are given clues as to how to better fill in the blanks. Elsewhere being other contemporary art forms, other works by foreign artists, or by looking to writers or commentators who knew contemporaries or who wrote about being present at performances by contemporaries. Francesco Corti, thanks very much for speaking to me today. Thank you. This was episode two of 10 from this, the third season of the Early Music Podcast. In the next episode, I will be speaking with Professor Dr. Tim Carter about Claudio Monteverdi and how understanding a work within the context of its original performance space might affect our perceptions in its performance today. I'm Andrew Byrne, and thanks for listening.